Good evening, Fort Collins Bible Church, and those of you who may also be tuning in with us, it is a pleasure and a joy for me to be here with you for another Thursday um, glance into the Word of God together. I'm very excited for what we're about to start studying. Um, We're going to be doing a series through the Upper Room Discourse of Christ, occupying the Gospel of John chapters 13 through 17. I'm uh, extremely excited about this study for a variety of reasons. For one, it is one of my favorite sections of Scripture in all of the Word of God, and one of my favorite books of Scripture in the Word of God. Um, today, we are, we're just going to kind of, this is going to be our introduction to where we're, I'm going to introduce the Upper Room Discourse of Christ, which took place, of course, in the Upper Room the night before he is crucified, directed to his disciples. Um, We're going to talk about the uniqueness and and character of the Upper Room Discourse in contrast to the other major discourses of Christ. We're going to talk about its direct application to us as members of the church, the body of Christ. And then we're going to look at the first few verses, the first four verses or so, and establish the occasion, the setting, and the tone for the Upper Room Discourse that's going to kind of pave the way to get us ready to study through all four chapters. Um, But before we dive in, would you bow your head and um, join me for a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the privilege to study it together, to rightly divide it, Father, as you've commanded us to do in Scripture. Um, We pray, Lord, as we are looking at the Upper Room Discourse, as we're studying these things, you would make the content clear to us. Uh, We pray that we'd be compelled and and motivated by it to apply it to our lives, to have a greater appreciation for your Son, to heed the example he's given us and and the incredible truths he's given us to live by. Um, Father, we thank you that you've given us your Holy Spirit to fill us Um, to produce the character of your Son in us, and we pray, Father, that as we study your Word, your Spirit would do just that in our lives, and that we'd go away from it not being hearers only, but doers of it. Uh, Father, bless our study. Give me focus and clarity, Lord, um, that those who hear may be edified, uh, that most importantly, you would be glorified. All of this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so let's, let's jump right in. The Upper Room Discourse, John chapters 13 through 17. As we look throughout the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there's a, a series of discourses or uh, formal discussions that, that Christ gives. And the three major ones are the Sermon on the Mount, perhaps the most well-known of all the discourses of Christ, which occupies Matthew chapters 5 through 7. The second major discourse of Christ is the Olivet Discourse, another very well-known discourse of Christ, which is found in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. And finally, the third major discourse of Christ is what we will be studying for the next several weeks, namely the Upper Room Discourse that Christ gives to his disciples the night before he is crucified. Each of these um, discourses are are unique and and contain their own content for a specifically directed audience in the historical time in which they were given. It has been said that the Bible is a historical record and we must interpret it within the times in which it was written. Um, The Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 through 7 is predominantly a Jewish context directed to a Jewish audience. We know in the Gospel of Matthew, the Lord Jesus Christ is portrayed as Messiah, the King of Israel. And uh, the concept of Christ coming and, and offering the kingdom to Israel as their Messiah in fulfillment of the Davidic covenant is a, is a very predominant theme in Matthew's Gospel, hence the continuous preaching, the kingdom of God is at hand. Um, In the Old Testament, it was prophesied, God gave a covenant to David that there will be an an everlasting kingdom 
and there will be a throne and a king who will rule on that throne in which uh, Jerusalem and, and Israel will, will be um, primary and the king, the Messiah, will rule on that throne in a, in a theocratic society. And there's a lot of benefits and, and great things. There'll be world peace, all kinds of things that go into that covenant that we're not going to talk about today so much. But the Sermon on the Mount, it, its context is kind of found in a lot of the, the living conditions, which will be true in the millennial kingdom, in the kingdom reign of Christ. Um, he also gives some of the motivations um, that kind of undergird the law and the commandments and he, and he gives the, the proper framework for his disciples as they would go out for ministers, as ministers and representatives of him. He gives them the proper motives to have in service in contrast to this sort of religiosity that the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees exhibited at that time. Um, hence, this is why Christ um, tells him, you, you know, as it is written in the law, this you shall not... Um, lust, but I tell you if you even, you, excuse me, you should not commit adultery, but I tell you if you even look at a woman in lustfulness, you've committed adultery in your heart. Uh, similarly, if you even hate your neighbor or your brother, you've committed murder. And he kind of gets to the heart of the law, the heart of the commandments, and, and gives the disciples a proper motivation for their service. Uh, and going back for a moment, uh, the, the promises about the kingdom that he will establish, this is why you have the continuous references in the Sermon on the Mount to um, uh, will inherit the earth, et cetera, et cetera. And there's application, of course, in that for us as believers, but it wasn't directly prescribed to church age believers. It was uh, prescribed to Israel during the time of uh, Messiah's first advent as he would offer them the kingdom, and it was directly pertinent to them. It will be directly pertinent to believers who live in the tribulation period yet future, um, which is also Jewish, just before Christ returns in the second advent and establishes the kingdom. Um, so, so it's important to recognize these things and interpret them in their proper contexts. Um, next, we have the Olivet Discourse, again in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, where Jesus describes many of the events that will take place during the time of, of the tribulation and the great tribulation. This is uh, prophesied throughout the Old Testament and, and discussed in the New Testament as well, a, a time called um, the time of great vexation, the time of Jacob's uh, trouble, the, the day of the Lord, Daniel's 70th week. There's much prophecy in scripture about this seven-year period for Israel where, where there will be um, tremendous disasters taking place, natural disasters. There will be the advent of the Antichrist. Uh, God's judgments and wrath will be poured out on the earth. Um, Satan will be heavily active on the earth. Uh, it's a seven-year event in which God's sort of last final dealings with Israel before he returns in the second advent, and we will return with him, and he will establish his kingdom, his millennial reign. So uh, again, this, the context of these verses is directed to Israel and most specifically directed to believers in the tribulation period. Um, scripture seems pretty clear that the church will not be a part of that tribulation period time we will be raptured before that. Again, that's not my focus today, but I'm just trying to give some background of, of the uniqueness of some of these discourses of Christ. Of course, in the Olive Discourses, the Sermon on the Mount, we draw secondary applications, but the primary focus is not towards us as believers in the New Testament body. Um, so both the Sermon on the Mount as well as the Olivet Discourse are entirely Jewish in character and in scope and anticipate some of the future things that God had prophesied in the Old Testament and has yet to fulfill, but will fulfill certainly, with Israel in his timing. The Upper Room Discourse, on the other hand, is totally unique and distinct in character from the other discourses because it's anticipating a, a new age. It's anticipating the what will characterize the life and the relationship of the believer to Christ in the New Testament, which is what we call the church age. In Matthew 16, the Lord Jesus says, upon this rock I will build 
my church a time yet future. We learn in the New Testament uh, in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, the, the Holy Spirit is poured out upon believers. He permanently indwells believers. The Holy Spirit baptizes believers, which is a spiritual, not a physical baptism, where we are uh, immersed into Christ and we partake in all that Christ is and has accomplished, and we share the same status as the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven as children of God. It says our life is hid in Christ. We are seated with him at the Father's right hand, and so we have all of the the privileges and uh, position of the Son of God and await to rule with him in his inheritance and in his destiny. Uh, this is an age of scripture that is unprecedented, unparalleled, um, unpredicted in the Old Testament. This is why the Apostle Paul ca calls it the mystery doctrine in the New Testament letters. And basically everything that we learn about what is true for our position, our privileges, our power, in the New Testament times that is delineated in the New Testament writings is anticipated in the upper room discourse as recorded by the Apostle John. Uh, Dr. Lewis Berry Chafer, who uh, was the founder of Dallas Theological Seminary, um, a phenomenal theologian who wrote a uh, outstanding uh, eight volume systematic theology, which I studied extensively in college, um, in that systematic theology, speaking of this upper room discourse, Dr. Chafer says that it is the foundation of that which constitutes the positions, possessions, and privileges of the Christian. And then he goes on to enumerate uh, seven themes in the upper room discourse that are vital to Christian life and service. Uh, those seven themes are a new relationship to God through Christ, cleansing unto unbroken fellowship, abiding in Christ for fruit bearing, a new relationship to the Holy Spirit, a new relationship um, between believers, a new ground of prayer, and a new hope. Um, so these are, these are outstanding things that should excite us that are directly true for us as believers in the New Testament church age. Um, a, a careful student of scripture will soon recognize in his studies that there are some stark distinctions and differences in the word of God as to how God relates to man in various stages of biblical history. Uh, for instance, as Christians, our relationship and duties before the Lord are going to vary drastically from that of Adam and Eve to God um, in the garden prior to when they fell and they sinned. Uh, similarly, um, we have distinct duties and, and privileges from an Israelite who lived prior to Christ's coming. This is why we don't go to a temple and, and sacrifice animals. This is why we worship on Sunday in commemoration of Christ's resurrection from the dead rather than on Saturday, which was the Jewish Sabbath. There are some very stark distinctions in the scriptures as to how God relates to man and uh, it is very important that we understand our role in the plan of God and his purpose for the ages. Paul commands Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15. He says, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, by way of an introduction to the uniqueness of the upper room discourse, I mention all of these things. I realize for some of us, this I may have gone over a lot of people's heads. It kind of hit a lot of serious doctrinal points. Some of us, it may have made sense to others. It may not make any sense yet. I would just say, bear with me because we're going to develop these concepts as we go throughout the upper room discourse. And as you've already probably noticed, the format kind of uh, to which I'm going to take in this study is going to be more of a study format than just a sermon format but I hope it excites us um, to learn and to understand the incredible promises Christ has given us, the power he's given us, and all that is true for those of us who live in this unique time of divine history. And uh, so we've got the introduction to the discourse and its uniqueness established. Now we're going to start to jump into the text itself. Um, but before uh, 
uh, excuse me, but as we do that, we're going to read um, the first five verses to get a feel for what's going on, and then we're going to kind of dive into that and establish the setting, the occasion, and the tone. So if you have your Bible, um, please turn with me to John 13. Um, I'd advise you to have a pen and paper as we do these studies. There's a lot of things I'm sure you may want to jot down. John chapter 13, starting with verse 1. Now before the Passover feast, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now supper being concluded, the devil had put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, that he came from God and was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, and took a towel and wrapped himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was wrapped. Um, the text goes on to describe that event where Jesus would wash the disciples' feet, uh, most of us are probably familiar with. Um, we see in the first verse, now before the Passover feast, and, and the occasion or the setting of the upper room discourse was in the upper room, Jesus would dine with his disciples to keep the Passover feast just before he would be tried unjustly, handed over, and crucified. Um, those of you who have watched um, my sermon two weeks ago, I talked about the Passover feast. I talked about how Christ was the fulfillment of it, that he is the true Passover lamb. Um, but just for a, a brief overview again, um, the Passover feast was one of the, the several feasts that Israel held annually. It was a memorial celebration where the Israelites would commemorate God's uh, deliverance of them out of the, their bondage in Egypt and establish them as a nation through the leadership of Moses. And this was kept annually. And we'll recall that God had delivered them by sparing them from death. The angel of death was sweeping through the land to take the firstborn out of every household, but God promised to his people that if they applied the blood of the lamb on their lintels and doorposts, when the death, the angel of death saw the blood, he would pass over. Judgment was passed over that house. Um, and so they, in obedience to God, they applied the blood and avoided his judgment. And of course, the Lord Jesus Christ is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. His blood has been shed uh, for us. Uh, his blood is applied to our hearts and God's judgment um, is averted by that blood and we get to spend eternity forever with him. But it was this event, the Passover event, that the disciples met with Jesus to dine uh, one last time. Um, we don't have it recorded in John's gospel, but in the synoptics in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it, it talks about how they acquired this upper room. Um, uh, Jesus had told the disciples, two of them, that you'll go and, and you'll meet a guy and, and he will um, basically provide this room for us. And in trusting what he had said, they, they did this. They, the man provided the room and they met in this upper room in privacy. It was just Jesus and the twelve. And uh, we get insight in these first three verses as to what was going on in Jesus' mind, what he knew, what was about to take place, what was going to transpire, which was going to be huge. It was going to be monumental. And the disciples didn't really understand everything that was going on, but the Lord knew. And what he knew determined what he was going to do for his disciples. Um, so... If you will, let's, let's try to, in our minds, kind of travel back in time in a, in a virtual time machine and, and be present in the upper room and, and really in a sort of intimate way try to imagine and experience everything that went on and, and, and how that event unfolded. Um, I'm sure many of us have, have, had, have celebrated feasts um, together with loved ones, with close ones. I could recall growing up maybe on certain holidays for uh, Thanksgiving meals or or whatnot, where we would gather together, and it was an intimate time of close fellowship where we're celebrating something specific. And 
This is, must have been how it was with Jesus and the disciples the night before he was crucified to keep the Passover feast. Um, it, it says that we, we get insight as we're in this Passover upper room and, and we're seeing the feast and the disciples are getting things ready. They're getting the table set up. They're getting the meal ready. They're, they're excited. They don't know what's about to transpire, but Christ knows a few things. The first thing he knew, we see in verse 1, is that his hour had come to depart from this world to the Father. And it says, having loved his own he, who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So Christ knew that his hour had come. This, this phrase, the hour of, of Christ, is, is a prominent motif or, or theme throughout John's gospel. It's, it's repeated over and over. Its first mention is in the second chapter of the gospel of John. Um, when Mary comes to Jesus at the, at the wedding uh, banquet where they run out of wine and she brings the problem to Christ and Christ says, what, what do you want with me? My hour has not yet come. Similarly, we see a few occasions in John 7.30 and, and John 8.20 where um, Jesus' opponents wanted to seize him. They wanted to arrest him. They wanted to kill him on the spot, but they were not able to. It says they were not able to apprehend him because his hour had not yet come. As we get closer to the end of John in, in John chapter 12.23, it says the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. And now when we get to John 13, Jesus knew that his hour had come. So what was this hour? Many commentators call this the climactic hour of Christ's life where his entire earthly career would have its culmination and fulfillment. It was the hour, the, the divinely appointed time when he would be glorified through his death for sins, his burial, his resurrection and ascension, where he would fulfill the, the primary reason, though he came for many reasons, the primary reason he came into this world in human form was to be the sacrifice for the sins of the world. And then he would be taken up in glory and seated at the Father's right hand. And Jesus knows that this hour is imminent, that this hour is, is about to take place. He also knows, secondly, <coughs> excuse me, he also knows, secondly, that uh, his traitor, Judas is about to um, is about to betray him. It says in verse two, now supper being concluded, the devil had put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. If we skip down to verse eleven, it's Jesus. It says, speaking of Christ, for he knew who would betray him. Um, so the other disciples have no idea what's going on. They have no idea that. Uh, Judas is about to betray Jesus, that Jesus is going to be handed over to the Sanhedrin, the Jewish court system of the time, that he's going to be charged on the accounts of, of blasphemy. He's going to be handed over to the Romans. He's going to be executed and crucified. Even though he had warned the disciples over and over again that he was going to die, that he was going to be buried, that he was going to resurrect the third day, they didn't understand all of these things at all. Thirdly, Jesus knew that the Father had given him all things and that he came from God and was going to God. The um, overarching theme, the predominant theme of John's gospel is portraying Jesus as eternal God made flesh, the incarnation of deity dwelling among us. In the very first chapter of John's gospel, speaking of Christ, who is called the eternal word, it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. All things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. In other words, the Lord Jesus Christ has eternally always been face to face in the presence of the Father. He is the expression of the Father. He created all things in Colossians, it tells us that Christ, all things were created through Christ and for Christ. Um, later in the first chapter of John, it tells us the word, the eternal word, which is divine, became flesh and dwelt among us. Um, continuously, this is repeated over and over in, in John's gospel, the truth that Jesus is God incarnate. And it was precisely for this reason that he said that he was the son of God in, in human form, that he was Messiah, that he was going to return um, at the right hand of power um, in the second advent. It was for these reasons that the Jews considered it blasphemy 
and wanted him to be condemned. But Jesus wasn't confused at all about who he was or where he was going back to. He lived on this heavenly timetable. Every day of his life was in complete subjugation to the Father under the power of the Holy Spirit in perfect obedience and commitment and devotion. And he would um, continue this way to the last breath he would take. Uh, in fact, the, the last breath he takes, he says, in your, my, your hands, Father, I commit my spirit. So Jesus wasn't confused at all about who he was. He knew where he was going to return. In Hebrews chapter 12, it, it commands us, it says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So the Lord Jesus Christ had the joy set before him that enabled him to endure the cross and all the pain and the suffering that he would go through. Um, so as we're in the upper room and we're, we're watching this feast about to transpire, Christ knows all of these things that are about to take place. He knows that his death is imminent and that he will fulfill the purpose for which he came into this world to serve and to die as a substitute for us. I find it uh, penetrating that the second half of the first verse, it says, in, no, in light of knowing all of these things, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Uh, this sort of selfless humility um, guided Christ to go to the cross, this love he had to serve the disciples, to take on the form of a servant, to wash their feet in fact, I think maybe the main theme that we're going to see throughout this whole chapter is, uh, is the fact that selfless humility is the soul of love. The love that Jesus had for the disciples was continuous. It was unceasing. It was unending. It was unconditional. It was sincere. It was selfless. It was sacrificial. And as we study the life of Christ, we see that his love was an exposition of his life. And even though his disciples would scatter and be disobedient to him, would be unworthy, he still loved them. And uh, the humility that Christ takes on is, is just remarkable. And it's been said by, by uh, another great Bible teacher that your capacity to love is directly related to your capacity to humble yourself. Biblical love is completely unselfish and indifferent to personal gain. So we're going to see that this love is, is very significant in, in the motivation that Christ had in washing the disciples' feet and serving them and in his whole entire discourse. Um, we're going to see in the 13th chapter that Judas is a very prominent figure. He comes up over and over again. We're going to spend most of our time on him when we get to verses 21 through uh, 30 in the next couple of weeks. So we're not going to talk too much about him right away. But he's a very he plays a very significant role in the Upper Room Discourse and, of course, in the betrayal of Christ. I do think it's significant to note, though, however, that um, from the get-go, Judas was never a believer, never a genuine believer, though he was with among the twelve, though he followed Christ and was with Christ through Christ's entire earthly ministry. He never did truly receive him as his Savior and Lord. Um, Jesus says earlier in John in the sixth chapter that, Look, have I not chosen you, my twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? And we learn that Judas is, uh, becomes indwelt personally by Satan himself when he betrays Christ. And Judas is one of two people in Scripture who bear the name Son of Perdition. The other person, of course, is Antichrist. Um, so Judas is, is an unpleasant person from the get-go with ill motives. He was not a believer. He didn't have the shield of faith to protect him. And the enemy was able to overpower him and use him ultimately for the destruction. But of course, God had that in his infinite wisdom and plan to be the means by which he would be handed over to go to the cross and be the perfect sacrifice. So 
th that's really probably as far as we're going to be able to, to go today. I, I know that we didn't get to get into the substance of the text too much yet. Um, but I did want to establish the uniqueness of the Upper Room Discourse. Today was primarily an introduction and, and establish the setting. And the setting was the Passover feast. The tone is Jesus' love for his own, even to the very end. And uh, we're going to see what we know what Jesus knew. We know what's about to take place. And, and we're going to see next week in the following verses what Jesus does as a result of what he knows. And that's take the form of a humble servant of God and wash the disciples' feet, which, which is just an incredible thought that we're going to develop next week. Um, I hope you stay with me as we study through this. Um, I hope you can be as excited about these chapters as I am. And uh, we're going to go ahead and close there for this evening. Um, gracious Father, we thank you for the pages of your word that are perfectly inspired. We thank you for the love that the Lord Jesus had for his disciples that he continues to have for us that was demonstrated in going to the cross, this love that was demonstrated in washing the disciples' feet. Thank you, Lord, for such a perfect Savior who loves us, who calls us to love as he loved, who calls us to be his witnesses to a lost and to a dying world. Thank you, Father, that you've entrusted us with the Great Commission. Uh, Lord God, uh, we pray that you'd be working in our hearts to uh, apply these things, to be excited about these things we consider. Uh, Father, all of this I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks for watching, and I, and I look forward to the next couple of weeks, and I hope to see you again. God bless you.